You are listening to the Antler and Feather Co. Podcast. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to another Antler and Feather Co. Podcast, the podcast for new and adult onset hunters. My name's Vince, and uh, so I'm wondering, are you guys having the season that you thought you would so far? Um, I don't feel like I am. I feel like it's going the exact opposite. I went into the season really optimistic, and so far, 15 days in, I'm questioning everything. So if you're like me, stick around because hopefully we're going to get to a lot of the answers to the questions I have, and hopefully we're going to find some solutions as to how I can turn this thing around. So as you guys know, this is the podcast where I am a newer, inexperienced hunter, and I like to bring people on who do know what they're talking about. And as I learn things from them, I just want to pass them right along to you guys. Before we get too far into the show, I wanted to take a second to tell you guys about Buzzard Roost Saddles. They say that their saddles ain't fancy, but they're wrong. These things are the most comfortable and adjustable saddles on the market. I've been sitting in one now for a little while, and I can tell you coming from the other big name saddle brand that I had, this thing kicks its ass. I have not had any pinch. I have not had any back discomfort. Um, The waistband's awesome. I don't need suspenders. This thing is just kick ass. You guys know I don't sell you crap that I don't use and believe in, and I really, really love Buzzard Roost. They're a great small company, American-made, support law enforcement, military. What more could you ask for? So if you're in the market for a new saddle or you've been thinking about saddle hunting, get yourself one. Use code AAFP10. That'll get you 10% off your very own Buzzard Roost saddle. Quick reminder, make sure you're getting signed up for that Antler and Feather Co. Best Buck Championship. We are partnered with Adams Precision Archery, um, Buzzard Roost Saddles, and Edible Outdoors Cook. And we put together a kick-ass prize package. You just go out, hunt, kill a big buck, and we'll judge them. The winner's going to get a championship belt, new gas bowstring, new Buzzard Roost saddle, grunt calls, hats. It's just a really cool prize package that we've put together. Details can be found on our Instagram You can just go. It's a pin post on our grid. Go get yourself registered. It's totally free. So now let's get into the good part. So as I said, I don't know about you, but I've been struggling with confidence in my ability to scout and find deer this season. Um, I've been putting everything we've been learning from the past guests into practice, and I am finding some deer sign, but I'm just not finding the deer. Once I get up in a tree, they're just not showing up. So as I said, Right now, it's October 15th. Uh, Scrapes and rubs are starting to pop up. So I think that might be part of my problem. I'm getting a little ahead of the deer this season. I think I'm looking for a sign that maybe it's just not been laid down yet. Um, So when I don't find anything, I'm getting frustrated. So on today's show, we're going to talk about scrapes, rubs, other signs and predictions for deer, and how we can kind of make sense of it all, put it into practice, and hopefully get our deer on the ground. Our guest today is Dr. Grant Woods. You guys know him from Growing Deer TV, and he is an absolute wealth of knowledge. If you follow Dr. Woods, you know he shares tons of information that ranges over just about anything deer-related that you can think of. So I'm going to throw a handful of questions that I personally have at him, um, and we're going to see what we can come up with for some answers. So let's welcome to the show Dr. Grant Woods. Dr. Woods, how are you doing today? Yeah, so thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm I'm honored to have you on here. Like I was telling you before, I uh I watched my first how to clean a deer video was you three years ago, and I've followed along ever since. Um I'm a huge fan of growing deer TV. Uh I've learned a ton from you. So to be able to share an hour with you is absolutely awesome. So have you been out? Did you go out hunting today? I did not today. It's a big uh, warm front today, rain coming in night, and a cold front. So rather than alert deer, get in there, and, and like no wind, like one mile an hour wind, I'm putting my eggs in that cold front basket. I actually did a bunch of honeydews today, kind of, you know, got a bunch done, cleaned out the, the carport and all that stuff. So saving my time for better conditions. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you actually posted something today. So guys, when you hear this, it's going to be a little bit afterwards, obviously, but you posted something really interesting today talking about um, how the humidity has something to do with scent. And that was totally new to me. That was really interesting. Um, without getting too far into that, basically, what is it? Lower humidity and high winds kind of are, or not high winds, but winds are a good situation. Yeah, so 
you know, for all, all the, sorry, all the bird hunters and rabbit hunters and, you know, guys that use dogs, guys and gals that use dogs, they want to be out there at daylight or early where that dew's on because that really holds scent. And if you have never had the privilege of hunting with a dog, and this is kind of crude, but I think everyone's done this. If you drive by a sewer treatment plant on a warm, humid day, you smell it for miles away. I mean, that scent's just holding on those water molecules. And But if you drive by on a real dry day, high pressure dry day, you, you don't even smell it. And then if you've got a, a pretty constant wind 10 miles an hour over, you, you're you putting your scent in a narrow cone and you know where it's going. Yeah. If you have a light wind, it's probably doing this, especially in trees. I think maybe some people don't think about this, but if you're in pretty thick timber, uh, that's like a good trout stream of rocks and eddies everywhere and water's yeah. going down and bouncing back. And that's what happens with air going through a lot of trees. But if, if you're in a, you know, a concrete canal, the water just goes straight downstream with almost no ripples. So if you're hunting Western Kansas, you know, not many trees around, the wind is very consistent. Even I look like a good hunter in Western Kansas because they're just, <laughs> it's dry and windy. And those are great conditions to get downwind of a deer and make an approach or let them pass by. Yeah, that's a that, that was an awesome awesome tip that that I picked up earlier that it just yeah, it's it, something like that I would have never even connected dots on. Like I would have never even thought, you know, why is humidity even being shown in my deer app? Now I can use that. So I appreciate yeah. that and I appreciate all the information you put out cuz it's 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 really you cover everything, literally everything. Um so yeah, like I, I mentioned in the intro, I kind of feel like I'm struggling compared to how I thought my season was going to start. Um, I, I think, like I said, I, I may be getting a little ahead of the deer in terms of I'm looking for scrapes and rubs earlier on when like they just haven't made them yet. Um, and that's yeah. something that I just, I still am learning uh, time frames as a newer hunter. So if anything, I've learned that this year. Um, so I'm going to hop into a prayer real quick and then we'll get into talking about kind of scrapes, rubs, what they're for. And, and so we can get a better understanding of how we can use the Intel when we do finally find it. Absolutely. All right. Lord Jesus. Um, first and foremost, I thank you for what you did on the cross for me. Mm. Um, Mm. you, you paid a debt that I absolutely could have never paid, um, and because of that, I am free to worship you. I'm free to worship the Father. Without that, we were damned to hell and literally had no hope, no future, absolutely nothing. And and you came down and you stood in our place. Um, and I'm just so, so very thankful for that. I'm also thankful for Dr. Dr. Woods for coming on here, spending some time with me, um, teaching us all the things that he knows. And I just couldn't be more thankful for that. Um, I ask that you would be over this conversation, uh, that you would make it educational, fun, um, and, and just, just a great conversation. So Lord, we thank you. And, uh, we ask all these things in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So as we mentioned, scrapes and rubs, it's October 15th. So scrapes and rubs from what I'm seeing, um, should be popping up now. I, I just kind of want to understand a little bit more in depth about scrapes and rubs. Why basically what is it? We'll start with scrapes. What is a scrape? Why yeah. do deer make them? So they've made a few scrapes on the way, field edges and whatnot. And that's more of a hierarchy thing among bucks. Obviously, you know, shoving around, tinkling a few antlers and you get October 15th throughout much of the whitetails range, you know, South Florida is different. And, Alabama, parts of Alabama, South Texas, whatever, but most 80% or more to range, there's going to be a few does becoming receptive now. So it, when does are receptive is that bell-shaped curve that seems to happen on everything in nature, and we're on that left side, we're, we're just starting to climb a little bit. So there's going to be a few does. I, just throw a number out there, one, two percent of the does are going to be receptive. So there's just enough perfume in the air to, to go from, you know, I'm playing with the boys to, hey, there might be a date out there. And scrapes, if you're old enough to remember, are like an old telephone booth. They're a stationary place where you can communicate. It's not like a cell phone that kind of goes with you, although deer have scent on their body, seven scent glands, whatever. But they really deposit that scent at scrapes. So there's two components, the ground part, and they urinate and other stuff in the ground part, and the overhanging limb. The overhanging limb is a critical part, and they will bucks will typically 
rub their preorbital or eye glands on there and their forehead gland, and they put their saliva on there, which is tied to some other glands, obviously. And actually, I did my master's on straight behavior on public land, and you know nobody knew much back then. I certainly know anything decades ago, and didn't have near the technology we have now. And there was this. It was on public land, and there's this bottom road by a creek that just all of a sudden tin scrapes, just almost like I laid out as a scientist. About every 50 yards, there was a scrape, and they were active and big. And I'd check on them every now and then, like, man. And I was trying to figure out what was important about scrapes. So I got the idea, and I don't know why, but I'm glad I did. That I would go to every other scrape with, you know, rubber boots, whatever on, doing the best I can. Now we're, we're respirating. We're never getting rid of all our scent. We're breathing and spittles coming out, and, you know, we're putting our scent everywhere. But Thought I was doing good. And I just, I would grab one limb, but not remove it. And the next one I'd grab and remove, put in a trash bag and carry out. So every other scrape, I took the overhanging limb out. And within two days, those scrapes, I removed the overhanging limb. Remember, I spent the same amount of time, grabbed the limb on the controls, but didn't remove the limb. They stayed active. And that's how important the overhanging limb is. Like if you got a buddy, you're tired of him killing big deer, just slide in the stand, cut that overhanging limb off, and I'm teasing and. <laughs> You know, he's not going to see a lot of action probably. But so scrapes are a point of communication and bucks, young bucks and old bucks use them. Does use them. They're usually just receivers. They're not mouthing the limb as much. They're taking in chemical communication. But the most common deer, the most frequent deer to visit a scrape is a button buck. You think of button bucks like ninth graders, freshmen in high school. They want to be in the game, but they're typically not clued in you know you remember maybe at least for me I was awkward you know you yeah. thought you knew how to dance but you didn't or whatever <laughs> you know and that's kind of button bucks and uh they're just all over you know if you if your goal is to harvest button bucks sit on a scrape you feel your tags I mean it's just and I like multiple scrapes I mean I like a lot of action I hear you mentioned and I hear you know primary secondary tertiary scapes and all this stuff and I I tried really hard as a scientist to define that and it boils down this there's scrapes that get used a whole lot they could be anywhere. There's scrapes to get you some, and there's one-time wonders. The deer makes it, and the leaf's over, and no one ever comes back. So, and scrapes that get used more, may, they're usually, but may not be bigger on the ground. I, I have research on this, but that overhanging limb would be wore out because they're mouthing it a lot. So overhanging limbs are usually broken over, you know, got the limb that's broken over, and it's just going to be tattered. It's just, and the deer don't want to break it all the way off because that's like, Unplugging a telephone, right? Doesn't mm. work. But they're going to mouth it. They're going to rub their preorbals, which means their antlers are getting in there. And it, it's going to look pretty tattered. That's the sign I look for. What exactly can make a deer come to a scrape over and over and over? And then maybe you have one of those secondary scrapes or whatever. You, why do they just stop going to certain ones? I'll just use another high school. You know, Betty Lou and Johnny and Fred are all going to have a get together after the ball game. But they almost always merge into one, right? Whoever gets the most traction gets, you know, and that's like a scrape. I've just noticed if you've got a choke hammer on a scrape and it's not getting many pictures and across the ridge, you got a choke hammer on another scrape, and boy, it's getting a lot of pictures. That first scrape will die or not just not get much use. It's just, you know, you go to a scrape to either leave communication to others and you want it to spread as far as it can, right? You're not trying to hide it. You're yelling, you're not whispering. Or you're going to receive information. And you want to get as much information about the local herd as you can. Now, the next question obviously is, well, what information is everyone sending and receiving? Right. And until we can talk to a deer, you know, hey, Bucky, what are you trying to tell everyone? It's just theory. But it clearly has to do with the breeding season, given the timing. And most people agree it's a doe maybe selecting a mate or seeing who's available in the area and bucks advertising their dominance. Some really cool research my friends at Mississippi State years ago, and this was really, I think, really creative research. Of course, they have a lot of captive deer, captive deer facility. And they cut the antlers off bucks because they're fired or injure other bucks in a pen. So they're letting them get just hard horn, get the measurements, get the data, weigh them for grams, all that stuff, and then cut them off. So they had this dominant buck that they cut, and this is a long time ago, so I made a slightly wrong. I think they had a dominant subordinate buck that the antler's been removed. And they did control tests. They put they screwed in literally to the bases, right? Didn't hurt the deer. It's all, you know, all the MRIs people are checking the eyes <laughs> and everything. But um, put big antlers on a big buck, and the does are through a fence. This is through a fence. 
would back up to that fence, put big antlers on the little buck, they'd back up to the fence. Big antlers matter. Now, now, the I think humans, you know, we're stupid. We think the big bucks run through the whole county breeding all does. That's not true. He's and I don't remember the stat here, but data showed he's breeding like an average of one more doe per rut than a yearling buck. Really? And, and people always think, well, that big buck's got better genes. But remember, the genetic code is set at conception. It's not changing. So if a button buck breeds or he breeds as a five-year-old, he's still passed on the same genetic information. Yeah. And do you find that, like, would a would a, a smaller buck tend to... I guess in the communication, like you said, you don't know without being able to actually talk to him. Would a smaller buck pick up on the fact that maybe a mature buck is there? Do you tend to see like they will back off that scrape and kind of... I don't know about backing off, but they may come in cautious. And And that's the whole thing about rattling or grunt calls or anything. If two-year-old bucks are, you know, they're the freshmen in college and they're dumb also. (laughs) And so they they tend to come running into a, a grunt call. And if they've been whipped a time or two later in season, they may, they're sliding down the wind trying to figure out who's there, right? Because they've already been beat up once. Yeah. Uh, so that's like the last semester, spring semester, and everybody's feeling rowdy. Seniors are tired of them, so they thump them a time or two. Yeah. Um, and a truly just, you know, the biggest buck in the neighborhood, he just walks in if yeah. he's coming. He don't have, he's not worried about getting beat up, right? Yeah. So that's why, just a little side tip, I want my grunt call right here somewhere. I don't know where I put it. Here it is. I want my grunt call to sound like a two-year-old buck. And what a grunt call communicates is, hey, I'm tending a receptive doe, or I think there's a receptive doe in the neighborhood. That's what a grunt does. I believe there's a receptive doe close by. So that's why it's so good at attracting other bucks, because they're going, oh, Betty Lou's over there. And if you're a big stud buck, you're not worried about who's dancing with Betty Lou. You're going right in. Right. But if you blow the big tuba call, you know, you, you go to stuff, Martin, and this call sounds like the stud of the woods. Yeah. Well, most other bucks are coming in downwind or going to bust 100, 100 in every season because they're scared to run in there. So what's the two-year-old buck sound like? <clears throat> well, he's a little high-pitched still, but most call companies mess up because to make high pitch, the reed goes faster. Mm-hmm. Slower vibrations, you know, lower tone, faster is higher. And so it's hard to get high pitched and not artificially too fast yeah like that uh so we help design some calls don't sell anything just for us with a weight on the end of a thin mylar reed so it slows it down but still thin enough to be high pitched yeah i was that's a that's an interesting thing because like the the grunt call that i use has you know the you can pull it slide it up and down yeah so you can i mean you can get to like where you sound like you're the devil like you get real yeah. low and it's like, yeah, yeah my, my grunts never going there. Yeah. The only time I'd even think about using that is I got the big stud mature buck out there and he's just not responding. I'll slide the rubber band down or whatever it is up or down, whatever it is. And just try to challenge him. But usually before I get to that, I'm using a snort wheeze. Cause in that situation, the snort wheeze is you, you usually get way more responses as a snort wheeze is a challenge call. Remember, a grunt call is I'm tending a receptive doe. A snort wheeze is if you don't get out of my area, I'm gonna I'm gonna hurt you. That's yeah. what a snort wheeze says. So it's the most bu- aggressive call in a deer woods. So do do uh bucks really not grunt for anything else then? I mean, you know, you they, have people they tend to think there's receptive doe around. I mean, you hear them go sometimes they'd be all wrapped up. Let's get our terms right, because I think there's a lot of confusion out there. So pre-rut is up till there's about 25, 30, depending on whose numbers you want to believe, of the does receptive, okay? there There's not enough does for them to be running all through the woods, but they're certainly looking. They know what's going on. The dance is getting ready to start. Once we get over about 30% of the does receptive, you don't need to go to a scrape. You don't need to do anything. You're just going through nose up, trying to cut the scent of receptive doe. And... You know, when you get really excited at the dance and you've had two or three fast dances, you may be grunting even though you're not smelling a doe. You're just you're just going for the next one. You're just all wound up. Right. So you're, I'm not saying there's always a receptive doe there, but most times there is. 
or the buck thinks there is, the buck perceives there is. So then Which what, brings us to another good point. Why don't we just put some sin out and <laughs> tell all the bucks there's a receptive doe right there? Right. And I, 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 I'm not, you know, good, bad, ugly. I just, you know, what it is. But when I was at the University of Georgia, my really good friend, Dr. Carl Miller, the smartest guy with deer. I mean, he, I'm a, I'm a field manager, and Dr. Miller's a, a chemical guy, and you know, really, really smart guy. I'm just a hard worker. Carl's a brilliant guy, good friend of mine. And uh, Carl would take receptive does. We need a receptive from chemical testing and letting bucks run into stalls in between the does, but couldn't get to them. They'd about, you know, when they're about trying to tear the tubes, they said, down, that does receptive. <laughs> literally. I mean, I've seen it, literally. Really? And so did a lot of work. And you take that urine out of that doe via catheter. So it doesn't interact with the bacteria on her surface. Uh, and you get normal response from that and a beaker of water with the buck. Really? But when it comes out the vent and interacts with, there's all kind of bacteria back there. Like don't clean a deer back there and eat your peanut butter sandwich without washing your hands. That's, <laughs> right. that's not going to work too well for you. Right. Uh, interacts that, it, it makes some kind of gas apparently, which is extremely volatile. So the creator's always got a plan, massive plan. So, you know, a doe's coming along and she's receptive. If that scent stayed like it does on shelf life or you pour it out in front of your stand for minutes, not hours, minutes, the buck, when he cut that doe trail, would go the wrong way 50% of the time. It's gotcha. so volatile. Within a few steps, that buck knows she went this way. And I've watched this many times. I'll see some does go by. I don't know if they're receptive or not. See a doe go by. You don't know for sure. Uh and a buck cuts that trail, and they take a few steps this way and a few steps that way, and then he definitively goes one way. And just like dogs, dogs don't go the wrong direction very often on a human trail. When they're trying to find a lost person or a convict or something, they go the right direction because the scent is different. Four feet over here, it's older. Right. And, and I think humans have such a hard time accepting this because our olfactory skills are, are, are just not even in the same planet. We can't even get there. Along with grunting, I guess, when is the best time to utilize a grunt call or rattling for that matter? That's one big confusing thing for me. Um, you know, when when you're when you look at the marketing of grunt and rattle uh, antlers and things like that, they kind of sell it to you that, you know, do it whenever. Like you can do it real early and, and you're going to make bucks think that there's little guys just messing around. Do it real late. Like what is the best time to actually utilize those calls and what is the best way to, cause you know, you can hear people who hammer on a grunt call and they're just, bruh, 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 you know, calling every five minutes. How, how should you actually use those calls? Well, I think different people are successful using different techniques, but if we're sticking to science, which science gives some, you know, everyone hates it when scientists say this, but you got to take stuff like that in context or the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's a really balanced sex ratio and there's a lot of competition for breeding rights, a grunt call is going to be much more effective even if, even if you misuse it. And if you're in an area where it's, and this doesn't happen much anymore, quality of your management theme is, spread pretty well throughout the whitetails range. But if you're in an area where everyone shoots every two-year-old and older buck and it's just yearlings and the sex ratio is a little skewed, three to one, something like that, um, it's not going to work as well. There's no competition for breeding. You know, five guys get into the all-girl college dance, you're not worried about it, right? You got dances all night. You got to right. dance your legs off. So, um, but I usually don't start grunting until about now when there's enough does receptive that bucks are kind of, not playing who's dominant, but hey, let's go to the dance type stuff. And I don't blind grunt much. I blind grunt if there's a lake or a bluff or something where deer can't get downwind because I, 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 I want to see all the deer. I want to see yearling bucks, does, fawns, two year olds, three year olds. And so knowing that younger bucks tend to circle in downwind or three roads come in downwind, depending on the age structure heard where you are, again, there's all these variables. Yeah. Uh, so I don't blind grunt much. Unless again, my backside is covered yeah. with the uh, something, um, and, and I'm even more picking that. I usually only grunt to a buck that I think is not coming to my stand, and only then if I think his approach will bring him on the correct wind. Yeah, because a lot of people call a deer. Oh, they didn't see it time to get panicky and reach for a grunt call, and and if if he responds at all, he's turning right into their wind. 
Right. Well, you better let that bug go and not alert him and yeah. see him another day. So yeah. don't call him into your wind because that's just not going to work. What about rattling? I mean, that's even more so, that's been even more confusing to me to the point where like, I don't even want to bring, I don't even bring antlers with me because I feel like I'm just going to screw it up worse than, you know, like I'm not confident that I know how to use it properly to actually bring anything in. Again, if you know, you've got a tuned up deer herd, you've been harvesting more does and bucks for several years in a row, and you're letting bucks get to older age structure and expressing dominance. Rattling could be a doggone good tool. Some of the ranches I work on South Texas, man, we go rattling just to see bucks. Yeah. And it works. Here at my place in Missouri, I rarely rattle. Um, it's riskier. I mean, you're moving, and movement is what deer see most. Everyone worries about color. Oh, that camo is two shades too dark or too light or whatever. Right. It means nothing to a deer, nothing. Movement is what they see. So deer vision about 60 degrees in front is stereo vision. Now, don't do this here. You look bad. But if we have both eyes open, we have better depth perception. Back before range finders, it was really important to have both eyes open when shooting a bow, which gave folks like me to wear glasses issues because uh, you get better depth perception. Mm -hmm. Single vision detects movement better. So to, again, the creator, so awesome. The evolution can never do this, but in front deer have about 60 degrees of stereo vision, depth perception. Think about it, boy, if you're eating acorns and you have depth perception, you're gonna bloody your nose, right? Right. On the sides, cause predators always tap from the rear to the side. They don't come head on. Right. The coyotes, whatever, they're, they're coming from the back or the side. Uh, so we got about 120 degrees on both sides of mono vision, single vision. And single vision is better for seeing movement. So we've all done this. You got the old nanny doe going in front of you, you need a little venison, and she's perpendicular to you. And you let her get slightly by you for that quarter and way shot. And you're she's looking dead ahead. She can't see you, and she busts you. Mm -hmm. Well, she's got 120 degrees of vision built just to see motion to keep the saber tooth tiger from attacking her. So you got to be careful with that. And you're rattling, which is way more movement than drawing a bow. A, draw's kinda, a bow is kind of straight line. Like, you're not seeing me move a lot, but you really see this. Right. Which is another point that drives me nuts. Hunters will spend $14,000 on the latest, greatest camo pants and vest. <laughs> but they won't buy a 99-cent pair of gloves. And that's, your hands are what move. Yeah. Your chest ain't moving a lot in the tree. You know, you're not doing this in a tree. But right. your face... And your hands are what's moving. They're the two most important things in camouflage. Yeah. So what is the, when you do rattle and you do it properly, what is that saying? What are you, why would, why is that for dough. Again, it's, it, it, it's about, I'm sorry, I get all wound up. I love no. deer. Uh, it's <laughs> competition too. for a doe, right? At that, like, I rattle late pre-rut, early rut. It's competition for a doe when I rattle. And a really good friend of mine from Iowa, Dr. Mickey Hellickson, great scientist. Uh, we cross paths at the University of Georgia. Really smart guy. He's in Texas now. Still has land in Iowa hunts. Um, his, his research, part of his doctoral research was on this rattling and a really cool ranch for some other reasons. They had, this is radio telemetry days, not GPS days. I'm old. They had towers and really flat land in, in South Texas. I don't remember ever so many hundred yards. So they could tell where the deer were and they had several mature bucks on this ranch fitted with radio telemetry collars so they could triangulate between towers or whatever okay and he would go out and rattle and grunt and and the rattling work was light and short light and long loud and short loud and long just good science right you you you, you have four things to definitively measure and your measuring responses, and you take out human bias with some of these towers out there, mm -hmm. okay? Now there's some bias, so he's not quite as hard this time, but Mickey's big old scrapping boy, and when he beats antlers, you can hear him. <laughs> he wears gloves, so he won't bust up his fingers and stuff, and that kind of aggressive rattling. Yeah. And unequivocally, by far, statistically speaking, with a large sample size, loud and low. Really? You're trying, oh yeah, you're trying to call deer. Now, if the deer's 50 yards away, you don't want to do that because he's going to say, I don't see a deer over there. I'm blowing out of here. Right. But if you don't see a deer, you know, you don't go, you know, if your kid's running towards the road, you don't go, hey, Johnny, hey, Johnny, don't go on the road. You blow your lungs out, man. Right. And, and when you want to communicate, you give it all you got. 
So then they think that two, maybe two inferior bucks are fighting over a doe and they want to come in and be like, both of you get I the heck out of here. I wouldn't necessarily say it's two inferior bucks, but again, there, there's not many chromosomes difference between a deer, an ant, and a human. Yeah. Which again, kind of goes back to one crater, right? I mean, it just, this, this just all makes so much sense if you just think just a little. Right. Uh, I don't know any species that doesn't gather around. There's a good fight. Yeah. You ever see the old Mucho of Omaha Wild Kingdom and two big rams or button heads, how they survived, I don't know. And it'd be six yearling rams just standing there watching. Yeah. About 10 feet out of the way so they don't get hit. <laughs> or in high school, you can get the biggest crowd together with the fight, especially if it's two girls, right? Because guys kind of, you know, take it easy. Girls are pulling hair and doing, you know, clawing and everything. Yeah. The biggest way, the best way to draw a crowd is a big fight. The difference is with humans, we think, well, we're just observers, no way I'm going to hurt. Deer don't know that. Deer are not humans. We don't think the same at all. Deer live by instinct. We we live by what we think we know, which is a huge difference. We'd be better live by instinct. Um, so, but you got rattling, no secret rattling is not alerting deer. I think with a grunt call or rattling, there are only three possible responses. Coming in, uh, Somehow they get alerted. I don't think it's ever called alerts them. They see you, smell you, get downwind or whatever, or neutral. They, they got, you know, they're going to the field. They're going chasing a doe. They just, and I'd say the biggest response is neutral. Mm. Just don't care. So back to uh, some sign stuff. What we all, I think we all know what a rub is. Um, why, why are those being made? I mean, are yeah. those... Other than, because, you know, you've hear, heard, you know, they, they're only trying to get velvet off, which by now it's off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. What do they do that for? Well, I mean, in our pens, we couldn't have a rub out there because deer would injure themselves and uh, their velvet come off just fine. There was nothing to rub on by design in the research pens and, and velvet. When, it, when, it, when that testosterone gets to a th- certain level, which is controlled by day length, that shortening day, actually through the eye, to the pineal gland, in the brain. That's what controls all this stuff. Like researchers have taken deer, put them in an enclosed barn and control the daylight. And they can make them grow antlers or shed antlers any month out of year. Really? Just by controlling the amount of light they get each day. Yeah, there's no mystery here. This is all known. People still yeah. argue. Well, that's, that's okay. You can argue all you want, but this research is <laughs> done decades ago. Yeah. Um, so uh, that velvet's coming off due to a, a hormone or a chemical reaction. But I think, you know, if it's flopping around or they might rub it, they're starting to rub. Uh, I think it's just instinctual. Some people say for strength training, I don't think that's it. Mock fighting. Now, one of the big reasons certainly to rubbing right now is getting that forehand gland. And again, my good friend, Dr. Carl Miller, tested the glands. There's, there's specialized cells right here. You probably notice that gets real red or dark brown at certain times of year, like during the rut. Yep. Well, that's, that's actually chemical coming out of those glands. And they enlarge that time of year, wickedly enlarge. So those are productive glands, and they're going to leave some scent. And, and I call two types of rubs. There's what I call non-traditional, which means they're once and done. And that's the vast majority of rubs. And, and then there's what we call traditional rubs. And tradition is that rub is used year after year after year. And you see scar tissue on the tree. There's You don't have to... If, you, if it doesn't look traditional you, as soon as you walk up, you don't have to, well, I, yeah, maybe. You're going to know because mm-hmm. the tree's going to try to heal over. It's going to scar. You're no. I've seen trees in good deer herds where, you know, we're harvesting a lot of does and letting bucks get old. They will kill trees. They'll rub it so much they'll kill them. Big trees. On a really good hunting property that's got a good tuned up deer herd, if they're not rubbing trees the size of my climbing stand can go up, I don't call it a rub. Yeah. A lot of people don't see those rubs. Because they're not hunting a tuned up deer herd. Right. Can you tell, people say you can tell like a deer's like size or age by a rub. Is that true? No. I, and no one knows. I, I have put a ton of camp. My, my PhD was on rubs and my master's on scrapes. And there's still stuff we're learning. Um, but I have studied rubs for four years of my life. And I will tell you this. It usually takes a big buck, we believe, to initiate a big rub. But you don't have a tree, you don't have a camera on a tree that's never been rubbed before. There's right. no reason to put a camera on one of a million trees where you're studying, right? right? So we're always running a little late on that one. But if you've got a traditional rub from last year, it's usually a mature buck to open it up. But then again, bucks, button bucks, spike bucks, they all will use that rub. 
it's just a communication post, but it's an inferior communication post to a scrape, but it can mark trails or travel corridors. You know, if you're you're going down a little patch of timber or whatever, and it's just rub after rub after rub, and it's fresh sign, some scrapes thrown in, you have found a travel corridor and get the wind in your favor and don't move. Just yeah. put your time in. That was my next question because yesterday when I was out, I had that situation where it was like, they were like saplings, you know, maybe two inches around. Yeah. And two of them right next to each other were rubbed. Then three feet, another one, three more feet, another one. So that's just indicating that's the direction this guy's moving. Oh, uh, maybe. It sounds like you found a staging area where bucks are kind of spending a little time before they move, you know, at morning or night or something. You find a bunch of rubs usually on a field edge. There'd be some small trees on a field edge or something, and they're standing back in their 50 yards rubbing, waiting for dark to come out. Mm -hmm. So when I find a bunch of rubs all together, not in a line, that's usually a transition zone, crossing the creek, a field edge, some reason where deer are pausing. Yeah, that actually is not too far off of a creek crossing to corn. So Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a transition. with A staging area transition zone, which could mark a great place to hunt. But again, our best places to hunt, irrelevant assign, is where we can approach, hunt, and exit without alerting deer. Because especially bow hunters this time of year, if you alert the deer, it doesn't matter how much sign is there. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing I've been kind of struggling with. Because as I'm finding sign, you know, depending on the wind, depending on just the terrain, sometimes it's like, it seems like, like I found uh, what I what I think was a buck bed yesterday, um, not terribly far off from those uh, rubs, but where it seemed like I was trying to put together where he might be traveling, it's like you almost have to walk through his bedroom to get, you know, for the for the particular wind. Um, and like I said, it's kind of it's weird because it's got creeks and lakes and stuff. So I don't know how to get it other than coming in on private, which I I'm not going to probably be able to do. But yeah, I, I that that's. That's a tough one to do on public land. <laughs> well, I mean, when you're hunting right next to an edge, a border it is because your access is limited. You're better to get in a core where you have access all around. The deer sign may be on the edge because of food or something like that, less high pressure or whatever. But the wind swirls, right? The wind's going to change. So if it's not right today, it'd be right tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day. As fronts move through, the wind is the fronts moving. The wind kind of goes around the clock, and on the back side, right here on the back side, it's going to pull out east. Front's moving by, all of a sudden there's a vacuum. There's a vacuum right behind the front. So right behind the front is typically here in the Midwest when we get an east wind. So while so, we're, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say while we're talking about that, I was I wanted to get into kind of some of the biggest factors in terms of you know weather and everything like that that you can use to kind of predict movement for deer. We hear, you know, checking barometric pressure, cold fronts, wind, rain. What specifically about, I'm, I'm curious about, what about barometric pressure seems to cause deer to be on their feet more or less? Well, let's think about when does barometric pressure make big changes? Usually right before a, st uh, a front. Yeah. So First all barometric time. pressure is telling us is a front's coming or front just left. It's not the pressure itself. But again, I, I've learned, I mean, I have a lot of friends in the business that have made deer prediction apps, whatnot, and they're all great hunters, great people. What I've learned is those are good, but what's better is predicting when I can hunt and not alert deer. I can find a sign. You minute you can scout, I can scout, I can find sign. I need to be able to find sign and then use the conditions to let me know I can get in there without alerting deer. The, Hunters are better hunters than they think, except they don't pay attention to alerting deer. Yeah. So I love a high pressure day because your scent is often rising and you can get away with almost a circle of scent free detection on a low pressure day. Your scent's getting pulled down. And if there's not much wind on low pressure day, you're making a scent cone. It's just drifting here 30 yards and here 50 yards and back there 70 yards. And you're making a scent cone and deer just can't get to you. They, their nose bumps into your ugly scent for to get in bow range. Yeah. So I, I I like high pressure days. I like a wind of eight to 10 miles an hour or more. 17 doesn't bother me at all. I may hang in a little bit more cover if it's 17 or 20, 
but I can tell you from GPS collars and, and trail cameras and everything else, deer are out there moving. So, so deer move. We always hear deer, well, they were on their feet today, they don't move. They move almost every single day, crepuscular, dawn and dusk, almost every day. We got enough, so much GPS data. Do they move five minutes earlier or five minutes later? Because often if we're tucked in next to a bed area or feeding area, we're playing a five-minute game. Right. You know, during the rut, you're hunting all day or whatever, but you're typically hunting a pretty short game. And like we've got a cold front coming here, and I will probably hunt a lot of Monday. Yeah. Because Tuesday night, it's supposed to get down to 27 degrees. We're 75 today, it's supposed to get to 27, almost a 50-degree change. Yeah, that's gonna shock deer, and and you know you know how it is. The first cold day to fall, you go out there and it's thirty degrees, and you about freeze to death. Yeah, and by winter time, you go. Well, I warmed up today. It's twenty six today. It's warm <laughs> today. I gotta take some jackets off. Right. Well, deer the same way. They're not used to twenty seven degrees. They just know doggone it's cold. I need and and deer generate deer generate heat by activity, and they got this big a mature deer's got this big old room and it's full of trillions and trillions of microbes. The more they feed those microbes, that's a big heater, the more heat they're putting off. So they're gonna feed. There's a tipping point in there somewhere. And, and it's gonna, it's, that tipping point's different from Florida to New York, but at some point it gets so cold, deer just lay down. Cause if you ever skin a deer, there's almost no hair on their hair to what we call thermal vents. Yeah. So they're up moving around, they're losing a lot of heat. It's better to lay in there tucked tight. Just like on a cold morning, you can't pull the covers up over there. They're laying tucked tight. So I'm gonna wait till midday to feed. You know, and that solar energy gets up there and it's heating up, then I'll go feed. So if it's 10%, not 10 degrees, because difference between 60 or 70 doesn't make much difference to you and I. Right. Right. I'm looking at percent. If it's 10% different, warmer, and it's, it's this time of year. So if it's warmer than normal, I'm probably not hunting. They're probably moving, but they're not going to get to where I can kill them in daylight hours. If it's 10% colder than normal, cold usually means high pressure. So that's another attitude to I can get in there without alerting deer. I'm hunting. So it's so when they're cold or when it's getting colder, that typically then they're you think they're gonna be on their feet more in Feeding daylight. A little bit. When the, Feeding when a little the, bit more. That's really and interesting. And remember, this is so important. It's not just when deer are active, especially for bow hunters. It's when they're active and I can get within bow range. Does the barometric pressure it it kind of when you were explaining that it kind of sounded like how someone would explain thermals. Is that actually like a hand in hand thing? No. Or how do those differ then at that point? So barometric pressures, you know, as wide as the front is. Thermals are every five feet, every ten feet, or whatever. So if it's really shady under the tree and the sun comes up, it's real shady. That air's still cool. You know, it's from hunting or whatever. And cold air is heavy and it wants to go down here. But over yeah. here, it's a big bare spot. Maybe it's a black field, and that's going to heat up. It's the same minute. It's 8.03. And over here, it's rushing down or the north side slope or the sun hadn't got yet. It's rushing down. On the south slope, it's rushing up. Thermals is only about ground to air temperature. Yeah, so that's why we check that with milkweed and things like that. Because I was yeah. thinking, because when you were saying, you know, de depending on the pressure, it was either sucking scent up or down, I was like, that. That sounds awfully <laughs> a lot like well, that. Had... But that's the difference. On a, on a really high pressure day, you can get away with hunting a little further down the ridge. You know, on, on most days, I'm going to hunt on a ridge top. I want the highest tree. Is that where the deer mostly are? No, but I'm going to not alert many deer there. Yeah. Further I get down the ridge, more likely it is to swirl. All yeah. right, elk, I got to tell you, elk are not the smartest animals in the classroom, but they got a giant nose on those rascals. And they're a herd animal, so there's a lot of noses out there working. And when they're in steep country, the Rockies, those thermals are super aggressive. It's just doggone tough to beat the thermals. So what about, I was also wondering, like we, I kind of told you earlier, what does wind and rain do to deer movement? Like when Yeah, you wind, have a... uh, you know, you get, in western Kansas, a 20-mile-an-hour wind is normal. Dude, I, I, I've killed deer out there trying to hold my hat down and draw at the same time and just super windy. <laughs> They're just used to it. Uh, here, 20, 25 mile an hour winds, probably high enough to keep them in, when I say cover, not necessarily better down, but, you know, the top of the tree is shaking, but the leaves are barely moving down here. Yeah. So I'm going to hunt where the wind's broken up a little bit. I don't want to get where it's too broken or it's going to swirl all the time. I want enough wind to keep my scent going one direction. 
I would much rather hunt on 25 mile an hour day than a no wind day. I almost never hunt on no wind day. To me, deer are really on edge when there's no wind. I think they can hear everything. They hear it so far. That's a theory. But no wind days, deer are really on edge. What about rain? Because well, I mean, rain, wind too. You know, you hear people, oh, it's way too windy to be out today, or a lot of people don't want to hunt in the rain. But I've also heard that in the rain can be some of the best hunting you've done. What do you find? Yeah, I think a, I think a light rain deer really moving. If it's a downpour, I don't get a lot of pictures on trail camera and downpour. Uh, a light rain. I think once you get a heavy enough rain where everything's moving and they they can't hear, they can't smell very far. You know, there's so much noise and everything's shaking. Every limb's out there shaking. They're, they're going, man, I need to get safety in bed down. I can't tell what's going on. Is yeah. my opinion. Yeah. Uh, but a light rain, especially a light rain with a little bit of wind, is incredible spot and stock conditions. But let's remember, we want to be good sportsmen, and it's really hard to blood trail a deer when it's raining the blood, the sign off. Right. So you need to be, if you're bow hunting, you need to curtail that some. Right. And what have you found with one of the big topics that gets debated heavily? What is your opinion on moon phase? And and maybe explain why some people really believe in it and why some don't. So when I was in graduate school, I was a poor graduate student. I had all this data from a bunch of projects and stats. I had, you know, PhD regression classes, whatnot. And I thought, based on observation data, I had figured crack the moon and it was about, I thought about 72% accurate, which is pretty doggone good Yeah. for deer. And so I partnered with it back in the day, it's totally different, but deer and deer hunting magazine or the biggest magazine, we come up with the DAI deer activity index. And I was selling a bunch. I mean, you know, I was buying a new gun every now and then grad school. We just don't <laughs> do that. You know, I mean, I was, I was jamming and uh, these doggone GPS cars come out which take a reading, put on your program, usually about every 15 minutes or so, and accurate within 10 feet or something like that. A lot of variables there. And I realized I was clueless. And I had to pull the DAI off the market because I was misleading me. And worse, I was misleading everyone that was spending $10 worth, $9.99 where it was to buy one of rascals. So be careful what you think you know. And Jeff Murray was a guy that wrote the book, the, the, uh, the Moon Guide, I think it was called. Man, he sold a billion copies of it. And just as I understand it, findings were from antelope in Africa. And that's a plains game. And there's a lot of things on the plains of Africa that want to eat an antelope. Yeah. A lot. Not, not a whitetail. And also a herd animal. Whitetails are not a herd animal. So... Uh, Jeff published a lot. A lot of people still believe it, but if you did, if we could see all the cameras out there watching, you did a poll and you say, "Hey, who wants on dark moon?" Quarter of hands would go up. Who wants on the rising moon? Who wants on you know? And who wants on a full moon? And basically, it's what they've killed or experienced. My granddaddy, he killed the biggest buck in the county on a full moon. That's when they moved. <laughs> but we, I was involved with. Four, I think it was fourteen other researchers. And we pulled our data. We had 10,000 conception dates. So if you and your wife, I know you have a couple of children, you probably went to a doctor and they did an ultrasound and they measured crown to rump and they say, Mr. and Miss so-and-so, your baby's going to be born next because they know how long the human gestation period is. Mm -hmm. And they know about the rate of growth of a human fetus so they can forecast when it's going to be born or backdate to when it's conceived. Well, when we harvest late season does or do herd health checks or something, those fetuses are big enough to measure. And a good friend of mine, Dr. Joe Hamilton, created the fetal scale. I'll show it here because I use this. I mean, it's kind of dirty to have in my office, but I use it. <laughs> and when we harvest a doe that has a visible fetus, that's one eighth inch long or longer. First hash mark is about 42 days. At about a one eighth inch long, that fetus is 42 days old. Okay, in a white tailed deer. And it takes about 200 days gestation period, 200 days to go from conception to birth. So we can remove those fetuses from roadkill deer, hunter harvest deer, whatever, and get a big enough sample size in an area and know exactly when does or most does were bred in that area. Well, all of us scientists got together, and this is decades ago, you can find the publication, but I believe we had somewhere over 10,000 samples from Maine to Florida. Very large database. Yeah. And we were going to figure out the moon. 
by golly, we're going to end this argument once and for all. We're putting this baby down. <laughs> and the regression line could not have been flatter. And if you don't know stats, a flat line means there's no relationship. It's not trending up. It's not trending down. We could not have made it up anymore. And we were comparing these conception dates to the moon cycles. Not just full moon, half moon. That's that's nonsense stuff there. That's people don't know what to talk about. The moon has an elliptical orbit around the Earth. So you can have a full, full moon that's way closer to the Earth's surface, more gravitational pull, than a month later, a moon that's on a different part of its elliptical orbit and be much further away. I think there is some stuff, there's certainly some stuff to the moon and ocean fishing, because the ocean is a big body of water, and that gravitational pull of the moon certainly Im impacts bait fish. Yeah. But it's not strong enough to knock acorns off a tree at a certain time. <laughs> And people say it's a light thing, but I've jumped a ton of deer walking to my stand and poor daylight after dark. I've never heard one hit a tree yet. I've yeah. never heard a deer run into a tree. <laughs> and they have taped a lucidium on the back of their eye. If you know what that is, it's another great thing God made. So light goes in, triggers all the rods and cones. It's this thing that's about like aluminum foil on the back of their eye and goes back out and triggers the rods and cones again. So they don't get 200%. They get about 180% of the light value. Way more than we get, right? Yeah. And that's why deer eyes and coon eyes and a lot of predator eyes shine back because they need to see at night. And human eyes don't shine back. We don't yeah. have tape to the lucidium. Gotcha. Okay. So it's not a light thing. It's not a light thing. It, 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 I think humans may see a few more deer on a full moon night when they're riding around because you can see further. Right. But yeah. there's no indication that hunters harvest more. There's there's millions of data points out here, right? Hunters don't har Hunters harvest more in a cold front. Now, so you, that's biased because I think a lot of people like me hunt more in a cold front. I'll yeah. just go front coming. I got to go hunting. So that's, that, I'm not saying that data is like rock solid. It's pretty biased, right? I'm going to skip work today's go front coming. <laughs> right. You had mentioned, though, that in the beginning, you you were kind of, so you kind of came up with the the moon phase idea just off observational data. Do yeah, you, so is, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I get all excited. No, I had all these it. projects where I was paid to harvest deer. I know it's a horrible life. We would shoot deer for money. Yeah, sounds terrible. It is horrible. <laughs> Golf courses, and we had a big aluminum plant, and they couldn't let public hunting on there because they had millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars of electrical substations feeding electricity to the plant, so you had to know where they are. It can't just be whipping bullets everywhere. And we harvested about 100 deer a year off there uh, for pollution uh, monitoring because when you smell aluminum, the old factories would put certain pollutants in there. It falls on vegetation. Deer are the biggest herbivore in a wild setting. So we would measure the deer to see how much of that is actually fluoride was in their body. Hmm. Anyway, uh, so had huge amounts of data and fairly decent with stats. But remember, garbage in, garbage out. And I was basing this off observation data, not like a GPS collar that's not biased. The deer just moving. Mm -hmm. And so I said, and those nasty GPS collars come out, sunk my ship, buddy. I mean, my <laughs> battleship was going down. Like I said, I, I've I've really, it gets passionate on the moon phase thing. Oh, yeah. So I'm glad we could kind of talk a little more about that, because that's definitely something I I know nothing about. And so I'll I'll just take your word for it. Well, one. no, let's 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 take let's refine that a little bit more. People talk moon like that's the only factor. Yeah. You know, there's moon, there's temperature, there's food sources, there's hunting pressure, there's predation pressure, uh, there's barometer, there's humidity levels, there's all these things. And it's really difficult. I have built what's called stepwise regression, multivariate regression, trying to combine all these. And it may put 5% value to this and 7 to that and 13 to that. And if that was what it was, I could figure that out or other people smarter than me could figure it out. The problem is they don't stay the same weight. Yeah. So a high pressure uh, that's associated with the hot front is not the same as a high pressure associated with the cold front. And, and, and there's no human so far smart enough. Some are trying to really put all those calculuses together because they're shifting daily. Now, you can get close. And there's some good indicators out there. There's some good ones out there. Uh, but I watched two or three. And, you know, one will say good, one will say great, one will say stay home and do the laundry. Yeah. I just hunt when I can. But like this, I had a choice. My, my wife's out of town, I'm batching. I said, well, I can get a bunch of stuff done and go hunting when this cold front comes. Or I can hunt today. And it wasn't necessarily a warmer day, but there was just no wind. 
So my scent is going to whiff, you know, you're going to get a little gust and it goes this way, and then the gust dies. So it's like a water eddy and it bounces, literally bounces back. And a lot of people use milkweed, but if you get really into this, go to Stuff Mart and buy you a bubble gun. It takes two AA batteries and kids, kids, I think, are too lazy to blow bubbles anymore. Yeah. So I got a battery powered bubble gun. And you can crank out about 500 bubbles with a trigger pull, right? Yeah. And the bubbles float. You get big ones, small ones, whatever. And they're real reflective so you can see them. And you go to your stand and, you know, oh, yeah, it's going, it's going to do it. And all of a sudden, the bubble comes floating back by you. <laughs> That's not a day you want to be hunting, right? Right. Because our germs, so, so we're respirating. And there are billions and billions of bacteria in our mouth. It's a cesspool. Why would ever kiss another human is beyond me. <laughs> and, it, and, and it's just spewing out nasty. So, you know, you want to brush your teeth good. You want to floss. And here's maybe some of the better camo. You want to use mouthwash. You really want, and you don't want to use, you know, spearmint flavored mouthwash or something. You just want, you know, a no sin if you can, strong mouthwash. And that'll buy you a little bit of time out there where you're not just blowing out yuck all the time. That that's interesting that you bring that up. So what when we hear like scent control and your scent, your scent, your scent, is there is there more? I mean, it kind of seems like you're you're talking about like maybe our breathing and our, you know, whatever comes out of our in and out of our mouth and nose when we're breathing. Is that typically like really what they're smelling? Is there something you should pay most attention to when you're talking well, I mean, about I scent think control? There's all kind of things, but deer walk by cars all the time. Think what a car smells like. Yeah. When they're conditioned to it, and they don't really, obviously, they don't fear it because they stand on the highway and get ran over all the time. Uh, but in some areas, I mean, if you go to a golf course or a city park, deer don't fear our scent, right? Right. Because they don't associate that with danger. In the middle of the timber where they don't smell a lot of human scent, then that's a new scent. And yeah. it could be BO, you climb a mountain, you're carrying all your stuff in. But when you're on the stand, you're constantly breathing. Right. It's just the one thing I talk about we can't do much about, you know, and the sprays that say I kill 100% of the bacteria. And you're, oh, man, it's all going to. If you killed 100% of the bacteria in your body, you would die. <laughs> literally, literally. Great point. There are symbiotic <laughs> bacteria in our body that helps us stay alive. Yeah. So you kind of throw those ads out off the bat because no one's dying from spraying it on there. But they're not killing 100% of the bacteria. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I wash my clothes. I keep them in a tub. I don't go out of my way to smell bad, but I promise you the wind is the thing I pay the most attention to. I like to hunt out of a redneck blind, so I might close the windows and just not let the wind blow your scent all over. You're still making scent, but it's just not blowing all over. Yeah, That's the big advantage of a closed blind versus a tree stand. Tree stand has advantage. You, you're a little more mobile. You can shoot, you know, 270 degrees or so. You're seeing more. Uh, you don't get hot in a warm part of the year or as hot, whatever. But a closed blind uh, certainly can have advantages. To close this thing off, what would you say, let's just go a top three. We talked about, you know, with the moon phase, you brought up like people want to focus on one thing. What are your top three things you're looking at, um, whether it be weather, wind, whatever it is, what is the top three that you look at to decide this looks like probably a better day to go hunt? Wind's number one. Got to control my scent. Got to know where my scent. I'm not controlling it. That's I, I phrased that wrong. I want to know where my scent's going. Right. Wind is number one. Uh, probably temperature above or below normal is number two. So wind's a strong number one. It's a, quite a distance to number two. Mm-hmm. You can kill a deer on a hot day. I mean, think about it. The, the deer season in South Florida, the Everglades unit, Opens in late, the rut down there is late July. That's when deer mm-hmm. breed. And I've been down there and mosquitoes are up your nose, in your ears, in your eyes. And I don't know why anyone wants something. It's miserable. <laughs> I've had to work down there. Uh, but they love it. Uh, season in coastal plains, South Carolina opens August 15th. I've been a, up a pine tree in many days when it's bumping 100 degrees. And, and I was having fun, loving it. But it's really tough to control your scent because you're, 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 some people may be perspiring. I'm sweating when I climb a pine tree at 98 degrees. I'm just, oh, yeah. I'm just flat out pouring. So wind is number one. Uh, variation of temperature to normal that day. It's not that it's 50 degrees. 50 degrees in June is a shocker. 50 degrees in October is, depending on where you are, of course, is you know no, no deal breaker, right? Right. I either want it normal or colder than normal. 
except in the late winter, I want it warmer than normal. So deer can just move at ease without conserving calories. And number three would be really uh, hoping I know what's the preferred food source. I'm going to assume that I and most of us can scout. We can find tracks and, and scat and feeding sign. We can scout. And we can look at a map. I use hunt stand and, oh, yeah, you know, it's hot today. They're probably going to be on a north-facing slope because it's going to be 10 degrees cooler over there. Mm -hmm. Or it's really cold today. They're going to be on a south-facing slope. Those are pretty elementary things that most of us can get on. Um, and then you start fine-tuning that based on your experiences and your, where you're hunting. And you're like a 30-mile-an-hour wind in western Kansas doesn't scare me. 30-mile-an-hour wind here, I'm thinking, boy, i got to be down the valley of the deer or not going to be on a ridgetop. They may be crossing it but they're not hanging up there. Right. Um, so I think I'll end with this. I, I love learning, man. I, you know, I'm personal friends with Mark Drew have been for decades. We've never done anything for money with each other. We've just been buddies. And I think the hunting public guys are just doing a great job and helping a lot of people learn stuff. And my good friend, Bill Winky and I was a brilliant strategist and a great guy. And I uh, Cus Strickland, Ronnie Cus Strickland is probably the smartest guy I know in the deer business. There's a lot of great people out there in the hunting world, really good people. Uh, and most of them are willing to help you, uh, but it's context. So what works in Mississippi, and, and Ronnie hunts all over, but what works in Mississippi may not work in Nebraska, much drier climate. Uh, so put it in context. My favorite article of all time, it was actually from a hunter in Iowa years ago, and I can't remember, Deer and Deer Hunting or North American Whitetail, big publication at the time, but 40 internet publications were everything. Mm -hmm. um, guy killed, I, I don't remember, a big, big, big old toad buck. I mean, just a whopper. And he shot it right off, I think it was I-80, you know, he was hunting land, but it was close to the interstate. He killed this big old buck for the time and wrote this article that all the big bucks in America are bedding next to highways because people don't hunt there. I'm thinking now we got 30 out six bullets ripping across highways over yeah. America, right? And I'm not saying that deer don't deer often like the bed where their backside is safe. Fence line, edge to a crop field, you know, somewhere where they feel safe, creek, water. But that doesn't, if you're in the middle of Smoky Mountains, there's no highways going through there, right? Right. So you got to put it in context. You got to learn from everyone and kind of whittle that down to what applies where you're hunting. You're hunting grandma's back five. A lot of this doesn't matter. You want the best food in the neighborhood so deer are coming at five acres. You don't want to spend all five acres on bedding because you got nowhere to hunt. Yeah. So put it in context and use what applies. Learn it all, but use what applies to you. You probably end up putting more venison in the freezer and antlers on the wall. Yeah, that's a perfect, perfect way to end it. And that's, I love that. Learn everything you can and then apply it to where you're at. Yeah. That's, but hey, I really, really appreciate it. I know I drug you all over heck on this episode. I just, this has been more of like a, you know, me having, I'm in that little rut of my own, not a, not a deer rut, but just a rut of like, what am I doing wrong? So I threw a lot at you and I appreciate you hanging out here for an hour and answering all my questions. And again, I, you know, I'm learning so much. I almost don't know how to use it, <laughs> but I appreciate it. Yeah. So when my daughter's they shot competitively or played sports or whatever. And they, you know, everyone gets so slump, whatever. I would just tell them, go back to the basics. Yeah. My one daughter played tennis. Just get that forehand down. Don't worry about her thing. Just get that forehand down. Uh, or, you know, they, my daughter's, I, I'm, this is not boasting. I, I'm like a three box dove hunter, <laughs> but my one daughter has been national champion trap shooter. I mean, she just lights out. Look, That's I mean, awesome. national champion. Um, and when she would get in a little slump, whatever, I'd say, honey, just just get in front of the bird. That's your only job. I don't care if you're four feet in front of the bird or eight feet in front of the bird, just get in front of the bird. Then we're fine tuning it from there. Uh, so a lot of times I find myself trying to get a little too fancy and I just, you know, deer are going to feed every day. They're going to get water every day. They're going to seek cover every day. And they're mainly crepuscular. They move at dawn and dusk, not about 90% of their movements, dawn and dusk. And around time, but briefly, that's because when thermals are changing, so they have protection 360 degrees from predators. Because mm -hmm. you got wind going up, wind going down. That, that's it's not vision, it's not other things. That's when they're gonna get the most protection from their nose. They don't have to see it, they don't have to hear it, they just gotta walk and smell. Yeah. Um, so just go back to the basics and have fun. Keep it fun for sure. 
I really appreciate it. Hey, let everybody know where they can find you. Um, if they're not already following you, which I'm sure all of my listeners are probably already following you, like on Instagram, but where can they find you online? Yeah, and- just any, any, any of those platforms, any of the streaming ones, Apple, of course, YouTube, uh, you know, whatever. just search for Growing Deer on whatever you use. You'll find us. You're stumbling into us somewhere out there. Thank you so much for spending this hour with me. Um, like I said, I've learned so much from you all the way back three years to when I was watching my first video on how to clean a deer. Um, not everybody that knows what they're, what they're doing, uh, is always so free to share the information and you share everything. Um, so I really appreciate that. I also appreciate that, um, you're a believer and you're not afraid to share that. Um, I think that's super important. Uh, and especially in the culture we're in now, um, to put Jesus first. So I appreciate that too. And, uh, guys, if you were not following us over on Instagram, follow us there at, at Antler Feather Co. We're also on YouTube, Antler and Feather Co. with the and sign, all one word. You can find us on Facebook, too, if you're over there. So if you guys like this show, if you learn something new, if you feel like you've got some, some new tools in your arsenal to take into the woods, um, please share, subscribe, follow, rate and review everywhere you're listening to this podcast. I, I just say this because when you guys rate and review, it really helps get the podcast out in front of more people. And that allows me to keep getting great guests on the show, which ultimately is going to make you a more deadly hunter. So I appreciate every one of you guys for listening. Thank you for tuning in this week. We will catch up with you next week. This is the Antler and Feather Co. Podcast.